Welcome to the show. I'm Antisocial. And this is the Antisocial Network. I want to talk to her, but I, my face is up against the wall. This week, I discuss the recent non-scandal involving Ellie Kemper in the Veiled Prophets Ball. Thanks for tuning in. talk about sweet, sweet Ellie Kemper. America's Golden Girl, known for her role as Erin in The Office and for starring in the hit TV series Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, has been slandered by Twitter. Recently, news came out claiming that the unassuming girl next door was actually a, quote, KKK queen. People thought Twitter was too quick to jump on the character assassination bandwagon and get her canceled, while most of news and entertainment media came to her defense. Many said that the debutante ball she attended over 20 years ago when she was barely an adult was not at all affiliated with the Klan and argued that it was a gross misrepresentation to claim such a thing. So then, why would anyone say that it was? Where did this even come from if it was such an outlandish idea, and how did it gain so much traction on Twitter? Surely there had to be some validity to this claim, or else it wouldn't be getting so much attention, right? That's what I thought anyway. I posted about Ellie Kemper's dark past at the Veiled Prophet Ball on my Instagram, calling her a KKK princess, and immediately got some pushback. The post I shared was clearly hyperbolic, yet everyone was taking it literally. People were saying it was irresponsible for me to post something so flagrantly false and that there was no such thing as a KKK princess, and insisting that the Veiled Prophet Ball had nothing to do with the Klan or racism. First of all, I am not an investigative journalist, and my page consists of mostly memes anyway, so I rate people holding me to the same standards as MSNBC was surprising to me. But even more startling was how many progressive types were so fast to defend the TV star, and by extension, the profits ball, without any real information or connection to it. Many people were angry with me and saying, Did you even do a simple Google search? And others still were vehemently defending the Prophet's Ball, insisting that it had always been racially inclusive and that the organization was actually founded to help black citizens of St. Louis during a workers' strike. First of all, I had googled it and checked the efficacy of the claim before posting it. Second of all, my post was hyperbolic. Anyone arguing semantics over the Klan was missing the point. But nevertheless, I felt compelled to research this further because enough people were defending Ellie Kemper that I figured I'd better do my due diligence. Still, I found it suspicious how as the day went on, more and more articles began to appear with apologist headlines in support of Kemper. The people who were arguing in my comments that I needed to do a simple Google had themselves likely only read one article by BuzzFeed or Vanity Fair. Quickly, there emerged several articles written by entertainment news channels that were in defense of Kemper, but none of them seemed to go into much depth about the origins of the ball she attended. They just explained away Kemper's involvement. I actually have an undergraduate degree in research, and I found it ironic that everyone attacking me had clearly done one Google search and clicked a single article to satisfy their doubts, and then accused me of not doing my research. Getting to the bottom of this was going to take more than one cursory scan of the first page of Google search results. Let me explain specifically what I'm talking about if you've listened this far and you still have no clue what's going on. Around the beginning of June, Twitter started posting old photos of actress Ellie Kemper at the 1999 Veiled Prophet Ball in St. Louis, Missouri. Kemper was 19 years old at the time and was crowned Queen of Love and Beauty. People on Twitter were claiming that the Veiled Prophet Ball is a fancy event put on by the local KKK, and that by attending and accepting an award, Kemper had been complicit in supporting a racist organization and perhaps by extension, that Kemper was a racist herself. To start, I had to find out more about this supposed Veiled Prophet Ball and the organization that puts it on, and to be sure I was getting non-biased information, I needed sources that wrote about it BEFORE this Kemper scandal. 
I didn't start with articles like the rush to cancel Ellie Kemper's based on a lie and dumpster diving through people's past isn't justice because I knew from their titles that they were only written to protect Kemper's reputation and I wanted the truth. After all, the notion that the veiled profit ball was racist had to come from somewhere, right? And I was determined to find out where. Well, as it turns out, almost one year ago, Jezebel posted a story about the Veiled Prophet Ball. Back in July of 2020, the site published a piece titled, What the Hell is This Racist Debutante Parade in St. Louis? Well, that title sure doesn't mince words. Despite all current articles that have recently come out claiming this event has nothing to do with racism, here's a whole-ass article predating the Kemper scandal claiming that, in fact, it's racist as shit. According to the article, the Prophet's Ball is a debutante parade in which an adult man dressed in a costume and mask covering his entire face, or the Veiled Prophet, is honored by parading a cachet of teenage girls in front of him. This man's identity is never revealed and is shrouded in mystery. In her Jezebel article, author Shannon Malero described the getup as a poorly executed papal cosplay. Despite protestations on my Instagram post that the organization in question was actually formed to help black workers during a labor strike, Malero points to a St. Louis area local publication for the Profit Ball's origins. From the St. Louis Today's Post-Dispatch archives, we find an article from December of 2019 titled, Veiled Profit, Symbol of Wealth, Power, and to Some, Racism. In it, author Beth O'Malley explains that the Veiled Prophet Parade was started by Alonzo Slayback, a Confederate officer in 1878. At the ball, the Prophet chooses a winner from the parade of co-eds in white dresses and crowns her queen. In a Dispatch article from 2019 about the Prophet Ball, it is explained that this event is attended by several historic St. Louis families and lists many prominent surnames from the area, including Kemper. Ellie Kemper attended the ceremony and was awarded Queen of Love and Beauty 22 years ago, back in 1999. But by then, the Profit Ball had already been rebranded as Fair St. Louis in 1992, seven years prior. However, this rebranding was in name only. While no longer called the Veiled Profit Ball, the newly dubbed Fair St. Louis was, and still is, hosted by the Veiled Profit organization to this day. What is the Veiled Prophet organization, and why did they rebrand their pedophile prophet thingy in 1992? While some want to argue that the Veiled Prophet Ball is inclusive and always has been, the organization has met with protests since its creation. In fact, at one point, they had to move their event from an auditorium owned by the city to a private venue over allegations of racism. In the archives from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, photos show black liberation activists picketing outside the ball on October 3, 1969. The Action Council to Improve Opportunities for Negroes led the protest, parading their own black-veiled prophet and his queen outside the event. In the caption it reads, Action frequently picketed the veiled prophet organization as racially exclusive and elitist. In 1972, members of the Action Council successfully in infiltrated the event and unmasked the prophet, revealing him to be none other than Tom K. Smith Jr., a vice president of Monsanto. Other such acts of protest by the council would include a man getting thrown out in 1975 for unfurling a banner calling the organization racist, and a woman being thrown out in 1976 after spraying an irritant into the air during the procession of girls. The elite organization would not begin admitting black members until 1979. This is getting a bit heavy. Let's take a quick snack break. Do you lack the majesty of a throbbing member? Are you willing but unable? Here at Pegasus Penises, we provide quality strap-ons for the Pegasus with unicorn dreams. Each strap-on is handcrafted and modeled after a real unicorn horn in order to deliver you a unique and enchanting experience. Choose from Mythic Sparkle Fart, My Little Puny, and Dinglehopper's Doppelganger for your pegging pleasure. That's Pegasus Penises for the hornless but horny. Hello, comrades! If you often get accused of hostile militant behavior when you're just trying to get to work, we may have the answer for you. Soup for your family is the perfect solution to ward off fascists, bootlickers, and their sympathizers. If you are constantly harassed and bullied by the state while merely trying to fight for the rights of the proletariat, we see you. 
Soup for your family is a great way to not only feed your family, but it serves as a silent signal to like-minded comrades that you stand with them in the fight against fascism. Whether you're eating it or throwing it in an act of solidarity, Soup for your family will never let you down. Welcome back. Let's dive in. By now, some Kemper apologists might be saying, okay, so maybe the event has a racist past, but what in America doesn't? Being started by a Confederate in the 1800s and having gone through some racial tension in the 70s doesn't mean they're affiliated with the Klan. Where did that allegation come from? Well, if you do an image search for First Veiled Prophet 1887, you will see that the very First Veiled Prophet wore a white robe and hood, and even carried a gun. However, the Klan did not universally adopt the white robe uniform until at least a few decades later, around 1914. Therefore, any comparison to the garb worn by members of the Klan could only be drawn later. However, in yet another article which predates this Ellie Kemper scandal, The Atlantic ran a piece about the Veiled Prophet back in 2014. In it, Scott Beauchamp explains that the aim of this event has always been for white elites to protect their positions of power. If you're like me, you're wondering who this veiled prophet creep is and how he's chosen. As the story goes, according to the Atlantic article I cited earlier, veiled prophet founder Alonzo Slayback and his brother Charles envisioned a secret society. They wanted to blend the extravagance of Mardi Gras with a symbolism used by the poet Thomas More. Along these lines, they created the concept of a mystical traveler who, for whatever reason, chose St. Louis as his headquarters. This would be the veiled prophet. The whole organization and event would be heavily steeped in ritual, and the mysterious traveler prophet man would be chosen by a committee of local elites. The reason for starting the Veiled Prophet organization was twofold. First, in the late 1800s, St. Louis had begun to fall out of favor in comparison to the now-booming Chicago. Slayback and the other founders wanted to recapture the excitement and stature of the antebellum-era St. Louis. The Veiled Prophet Parade would harken back to a time when the area was known for the St. Louis Agricultural Fair, a sort of trade show and harvest festival combined. In addition, and even more importantly, Slayback was influenced by the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, in which nearly 1,500 railroad workers of all races came together to successfully stop all rail freight from moving for an entire week. In the end, federal troops and 5,000 vigilante civilian volunteers, now dubbed Special Police, put an end to the strike, but not before 18 people were killed in the dispersal order. In total, the strike lasted 45 days. This new uprising of workers who demanded social and economic justice was unacceptable to Slayback and the other ruling elite of St. Louis. By creating the Veiled Prophet organization and staging lavish events, they would not only bring a sense of prestige back to St. Louis, but it would also help to impress the values of the upper echelon to the working class of the city. As historian Thomas M. Spencer would later write, boosting trade was one of the main goals of the Veiled Prophet organization and that class control was an equally important objective. The only veiled prophet to ever willingly disclose his identity was a cop who had been crucial in helping squash the railroad strike of the late 1800s. I have no idea where that person on my Instagram got their information about the veiled prophet organization being started to help black workers, because all the research I did actually showed that the veiled prophet organization was started as a result of the fear that racial unity was causing. Let's also not forget the history and implications behind debutante balls themselves. As described in the Atlantic article, few things struck as much fear into the hearts of city fathers as white-black labor cooperation. To think that an annual ball consisting of adolescent girls dressed in white who are paraded before a grown man in a veil is about anything besides preserving teenage girls' virginity for the sake of adult men's approval is willful ignorance. Likewise, arguing that the veiled profit ball is not rooted in preserving white purity would be remiss. But what does this really have to do with Ellie Kemper? I mean, yes, she attended the parade and won in 1999, but how does the Veiled Prophet organization's racist past implicate her? Especially since they started admitting black people in 1979 and changed their name to the Fair St. Louis in 1992. Over the years, the event has changed many times. It was originally held in the fall, 
then was moved to the Friday before Christmas, and is now celebrated every July 4th and is touted as the country's biggest birthday party. One could argue the event has moved a long ways away from its racist origin story, and shouldn't be condemned for mistakes of the past. But that is precisely the kind of mindset that turns a blind eye while perpetuating and upholding systems of white supremacy that were implanted hundreds of years ago and have been embedded into the fabric of our society to this day. Ignoring the fact that the Veiled Prophet organization has a racist history amounts to erasure, and without acknowledgement and atonement for such mistakes of the past, pretending like they never happened equates to violence. While the event may have been rebranded, it is still hosted each year by the Veiled Prophets. Many people want to jump to Kemper's defense. Everyone's so fearful that some attempt to cancel her will be made. People lashed out at me and others for sharing memes that joked about the Klan and mocked Kemper. But everyone jumping to defend Kemper and say that participation in such an event doesn't equal racism is exactly the problem. White women are some of the worst culprits of perpetuating systemic racism and then feigning ignorance. All the news outlets that reported on this were so fast to make the distinction that the event is not affiliated with the Klan without making any real effort to dissect why this was such a clickable story. They all wanted to blame cancel culture and reactionary politics for being so quick to throw an innocent and unsuspecting white woman under the bus. Intent mattered, and Kemper was basically a kid when she attended that debutante ball. Was this fair? An Insider article scolded us all with the headline, Dumpster diving through people's pasts isn't justice, it's punishment culture. Like the people who lashed out on my Instagram post, the general error was that we got this wrong and we should all be ashamed of ourselves. But is it unfair to hold white women accountable for their complicity in such things? I think the real news story is not that a white woman participated in a debutante ball that was kinda racist 20 years ago, but that all of Hollywood gathered together on cue to defend her and say it was no big deal once it blew up on Twitter. Because after all, Ellie Kemper could be any one of our daughters or sisters or wives. Her unassuming and demure presence at a historically racist gathering can't possibly say anything about her character. After all, women are weak and play no role in the actual operation of anything anyway, right? How could little old Ellie know? In a June 4th article also released amidst this Kemper scandal, Tamika Thompson wrote on thegrio.com about the sad and exhausting pitfalls of white allyship. In it, she references the latest uproar over Ellie's crown at the 1999 Prophets Ball. She wonders how it comes to be that a white woman like Kemper can end up starring opposite someone like Hannibal Buress, who is known for being outspoken on black and gay issues. Some may be trying to downplay the significance here, writes Thompson, but the actress's own lack of response is actually quite telling. Silence, in this case, is complicit. Thompson also acknowledges that while there's no direct connection between the KKK and the Veiled Prophet, she says, quote, their differences are hardly appreciable. Thompson's article is the only one that was really calling out what's actually at play here, and I'm not surprised as it's the only one I could find on the subject that was written by a black woman. Instead of carrying on forever about the fallacy of connecting the clan to the ball, she dismissed it as the distraction it was and called out problematic white allyship that does the bare minimum when it comes to taking accountability. What struck me about this scandal was how many people felt so righteous and compelled to set the record straight. I had no idea Ellie Kemper had so many loyal fans. I say that ironically because people's indignation seemed much more about piety and preserving any pristine image they had in their minds of The Office or Kimmy Schmidt. In a pathetic attempt to grasp at straws and justify Ellie's past, I heard some offer the suggestion that she had changed now, saying, wasn't this common knowledge that she openly talks about, escaping a racist cult and creating a show about it? First of all, I have no clue if that's true, but I know that Tina Fey wrote Kimmy Schmidt, not Ellie Kemper, and that the show was loosely based on the Ariel Castro story, a man who kidnapped three women in the early 2000s and held them captive for over 10 years. While it's possible Ellie Kemper does feel like she escaped a racist cult and that could have led to her decision to take the role as Kimmy Schmidt, the show is not about reconciling her past culpability in upholding white supremacy. It's about supposed mole women who were kept underground for so long that when they emerge, they are unaware of social norms to the point of comedy. It's not exactly a story about atonement. Another article I read that appeared after the Twitter storm over Kemper was titled, The Rush to Cancel Ellie Kemper is Based on a Lie. But what rush to cancel Ellie? 
The implication was that everyone was frothing at the mouth at the mere prospect of ruining this woman's career, but that's not what happened. The criticisms raised about the Prophet's Ball and women like Kemper's role in it were valid. The only people rushing to conclusions were the throngs of media who ran to Kemper's aid, pointing fingers everywhere but at Kemper and accusing us all of being nosy leeches. Articles that did address the racist history of the event were quick to distance Kemper from the sordid details, claiming that yes, maybe the Veiled Prophet Ball was racist, but participation in it did not make Kemper racist by proxy. The thing is, if we were all to admit that attending such an event equals complicity in perpetuating systems of oppression, then we'd have to admit that all white women are guilty of this. That's what's really going on here. Kemper's interest in a debutante ball was merely extracurricular. How can we fault her for participating in something that all innocent young girls in St. Louis might be expected to participate in had they been invited? And that's the point. Everyone brushing off the fact that Kemper was crowned queen at one of these balls is the kind of systemic racism that continues unnoticed in all sorts of institutions and organizations. That was why so many people on Twitter reacted to this story. Not simply because one white woman may have unknowingly participated in a racist tradition, but the fact that thousands of women have, and still do every year. The reaction of so many news sources to defend Kemper without even so much as a statement from the actress herself is proof positive that the tendency to protect and defend white women is second nature to many. They don't even question culpability. Her innocence is assumed. As if proving that the Klan is not affiliated with the Prophet's Ball somehow also negates any suggestions of racism in the organization or white accountability. It's a red herring. If you look at this Kemper debacle closely, you will notice that most of the people who have claimed Kemper is racist are people of color, many black women. Most of the authors of the articles jumping to Kemper's defense are white men and women. When this story first hit the news cycle, the AV Club ran a story titled, Yet Another Rich White Celebrity with a Racist Past, but days later toned it down and edited the headline to say instead, Oh great, Ellie Kemper participated in a ball with racist skeletons in its closet. Language matters, and shifting the dialogue to one that says yes, this event is racist, but one of the past winners who is arguably the most famous participant had no clue and should not be held accountable for her participation, is coddling and repackaging white culpability in a way that only succeeds in perpetuating systemic racism. We as white women cannot continue to perpetuate violence by being on-screen liberals who stand beside gay black actors on the red carpet one minute, then stand silent when confronted with how our actions may be perceived by or even hurt people of color. I say this as a white woman who has made mistakes and will continue to make mistakes. Carving out space to elevate less privileged people, or simply shutting up so we can give voice to someone else, is not something white women are taught. White women are taught that our brand of feminism slash colonialism is the right one, and that we don't need to lift up voices of color if we can just speak for them. We have to train ourselves not only to listen to people of color when it's convenient or regrammable, but when we are the perpetrators of violence as well. To all who were so fast to defend Ellie Kemper and found it so important to make the distinction that the St. Louis Festival is not associated with the Klan, I ask you to examine why that reaction was so fast for you and why it may have been an emotional response. History has shown the racist origins of the Prophet Parade, regardless of Klan affiliation. So, arguing that fact seems like semantics. White women may be oppressed as women, but they still have the power themselves to oppress. Too often throughout our country's history, we have turned a blind eye to white women's participation in carrying out patriarchal racist norms in order to preserve our own privilege. This isn't the antebellum South. White women are not fragile doilies that need fainting couches to recover from our ungodly tight bodices. We need to stop pretending like we are guiltless blind little birds when it comes to carrying out racist traditions and systems. I could have forgiven Kemper for her participation in such an event had she come forward and spoken about systemic racism and white accountability, made a statement about how much she's changed or is trying to change, or condemned the organization's past. But she didn't do any of these things. She allowed several news and entertainment outlets to come to her defense, silencing and condemning black voices in the process. And that, to me, is the action that is unforgivable. 
That's my show for this week. I'm Antisocial, and this is the Antisocial Network. If you want even more access to me, Antisocial, follow me on Instagram at the Antisocial Network. To support my content creation dreams and to receive two bonus episodes a month, subscribe to my Patreon for only $5 at patreon.com slash the Antisocial Network. And for a limited time, new patrons will receive Antisocial Network stickers and a top-secret handmade zine made by me, Antisocial. To send me voice memos or to submit your own funny fake ad that I might use in my my podcast, download the Anchor app and find my show there. As always, new episodes are available in the free feed every week. See you next Wednesday. Later. But I'm into sociable, yeah.